Uh, we're going to move into our next uh, presentation from Nature and Bee, and we've got the Director of Conservation, uh, Adam Cheeseman. Mr. Cheeseman, um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. So you have 20 minutes to make your presentation, and uh, following your 20 minutes, we will have 40 minutes of questions. Great. Okay, the floor is now yours. Perfect, thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for providing uh, Nature and Bee with the time to present on our uh, climate change work today. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm joining from the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq uh, Mi peoples um, in Mi'kma'ki, uh, specifically in Sicknick uh, in Sackville. Um, and really excited to share um, some information on our organization, our climate change work, and some perspectives on um, the new climate change plan for the province. Um, so as, as mentioned, my name is Adam Cheeseman. Um, I work for Nature and Bee as our director of conservation. Um, and one of our major projects under our conservation team is, um, of course, climate change and specifically focused on climate change adaptation um, and working with nature and nature-based climate solutions. So that'll be a lot of what um, I speak about today. Um, so who, who are we? Um, Nature and Bee is a provincial uh, non-for-profit charitable organization. Um, and we work to celebrate, conserve, and protect uh, New Brunswick's natural heritage. And so we represent um, over 14 different nature clubs from every corner of the province. Uh, and really our organiz organization started from a coming together of different naturalist groups uh, from across the province in the 1970s. Um, our approach to our work is really focused on education, uh, networking, and collaboration. And so we bring that kind of spirit to all of our different projects, whether it be our youth programs or our natural workshops um, or our conservation programs for species at risk um, or for our climate change work. Um, so I'm going to be presenting today, as I mentioned, on behalf of our climate change adaptation program. Um, we work really closely with a number of groups um, that you've heard from already over the past couple of weeks and who you'll hear from still, um, including the New Brunswick Environmental Network, uh, Climate Atlantic, um, and many others, yeah, including the Conservation Council. Um, and we also have a really strong working relationship with um, environment, local government, as well as the Climate Change Secretariat as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so what do we do at Nature and Bee, just really briefly? Um, we undertake work uh, in various parts of the province uh, with our head office in Fredericton uh, and satellite offices in Carleton County, uh, Trakadi Shila, and Sackville. Um, and we do projects that aim to educate New Brunswickers about nature uh, and celebrate our natural heritage. Um, we work on various stewardship and citizen science projects, um, have a long-standing uh, multi-decade piping plover species at risk pro conservation project in the Acadian Peninsula that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and more recently, we've been um, also begun to support kind of conservation planning um, for agricultural areas of the Wollastook St. John River watershed. Um, and we lead another kind of collaborative initiative that involves climate change as well called Healthy Coasts NB. Uh, which is a large-scale conservation and climate change project that looks at um, the coastal areas of eastern New Brunswick all the way from the Nova Scotia border to the Quebec border. Um, and this year, uh, we're actually celebrating our 50th anniversary, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, we recently released our new logo, which you can see on the slide. Um, and so I'd invite everyone to, you know, you can check out our website for more information about our organization um, in general at naturemb.ca. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. So what are we doing on climate change? Um, really, our work focuses on um, a big topic that I'm going to touch on today, which is nature-based climate adaptation. Um, and so we're really interested in how we can mainstream this approach um, at the individual level, the community level, and the provincial level in New Brunswick. Um, and specifically, we focus on capacity building for professionals and for individuals, um, sharing successes and lessons learned, um, education, and again, collaboration. Um, and one of our big projects in this sphere has been around working um, under a project funded through the Natural Resources Canada um, and the Environmental Trust Fund uh, with the New Brunswick Environmental Network, uh, focused on um, increasing the capacity and expertise of engineers and NGOs and land use planners to integrate nature-based climate solutions into their work. Um, and so these nature-based climate solutions, you know, focus on approaches that work with nature uh, to help us mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, whether this be through things like wetland restoration, um, you know, implementing best management practices for our agricultural areas, or avoiding the degradation of natural areas like peatlands and forests that can, um, you know, not only sequester carbon, but also um, do things like slow down flood water um, and enhance water quality, while also providing, you know, improvements to our physical and mental health and, and that sort of work. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So just to kind of set the stage a little bit for some of the recommendations and thoughts that we have about the updated climate plan, um, I just wanted to share a little bit more background on you know, what nature-based climate adaptation is to us. Um, so we kind of see adaptation approaches as on a spectrum um, where we move kind of from the left side here where we see kind of more of an engineered type of approach where we have um, you know, a lot of things that we see um, across the province. Uh, we have you know, riprap along our shorelines. Uh, we have larger culverts that are being installed to handle um, heavier flows as a result of climate change uh, and these sorts of engineered approaches. Uh, and while there's you know, obviously a time and a place for these, we also like to look at you know, these more nature-based approaches and think about how can we work with nature as well to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, and one of the big reasons that we want to do this that we'll all introduce in a moment too is this idea of co-benefits and why um, when we uh, use nature um, in our climate adaptation approaches that we can get a number of co-benefits or additional benefits that come with that. Um, so some examples of nature-based approaches might be you know, conserving coastal wetlands or moving development away from coastal wetlands in order to help those systems buffer against uh, wave energy and storm surges. Um, it might be you know, planting um, native vegetation along our shorelines to help uh, reduce erosion and kind of anchor those uh, sediments in, um, or it could be, you know, as, as simple as, you know, improve forest management um, or protecting peatlands. So sometimes you don't actually have to do anything. It's just a matter of protecting what's already there and, and protecting those intact ecosystems. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to share this as a resource as well. Um, this is a part of our project that I mentioned before that we're working on with the New Brunswick Environmental Network. Um, we've put together a case study map of all of the, not all, of many of the natural and nature-based uh, climate change solution adaptation projects that have occurred um, across Canada in collaboration with Nature Canada. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this work started in New Brunswick um, in 2018 in terms of collecting some of these lessons learned in these different projects. And as you can see by the pins on the map, we have examples from across the province. Um, and there's actually over 45 projects that are featured on this, on this website. Um, so I'd encourage folks to check that out um, and to learn more about some of the different approaches that I'm gonna be talking about as I move through the presentation. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, and so as some of the other speakers have discussed last week, there was, um, you know, there was an emphasis on adaptation in, in the past climate change uh, action plan, but we do think that there could be a greater emphasis in this plan. Um, and adaptation and more specifically nature-based adaptation uh, is incredibly important because even if we're to ramp up mitigation efforts right now, um, we, we are still gonna face the impacts of climate change, um, including some of them that I've listed on the slide here. And so just to reiterate, I guess, that it's not to deter action away from mitigation, uh, but we really need to be focused on both adaptation and mitigation and trying to find those those win-win solutions where we can you know, have one investment where we're actually gonna be getting returns on our investment that benefit both mitigation in terms of either um, avoiding carbon pollution in our in going into the, the air or pulling it out, as well as protecting our communities and our infrastructure um, through adaptation. So it's really about looking for these win-win approaches. And from our perspective, this is what the real benefit of these nature-based projects are. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So this is just an example um, of what I'm talking about in kind of a graphic form. So why nature-based adaptation? And for us, again, the short answer are these co-benefits. So these these win-win approaches or these additional benefits you get from these projects. Um, so the graphic shows the benefits of nature-based adaptation uh, in the context of co-benefits. Um, as we can see, when we keep our natural areas healthy with things like good forest management, wide buffers, uh, wetland protections, developing further away from the coast, um, et cetera, we're provided with services that um, protect our diverse ways of life, um, reduce risk from situations like flooding, uh, contribute positively to air quality, sequester carbon, improve habitat, protect species at risk, you know, all the list goes on and on. And so this all comes with understanding how we can protect, restore, and or adequate, adequately manage uh, the various ecosystems that we live within uh, in our province. Um, and I also just want to mention, you know, these are in a lot of cases, um, free or low cost services that, that we're getting um, from the natural environment. And so by being good stewards and by protecting what we have, um, we can continue to benefit from these free or low cost services. And even with a small investment, we can get a big, a big benefit. Um, next slide, please. So that was a, just a bit of background and I just wanna take some time now to um, talk about what we perceive as opportunities under the current climate plan. 
Um, and these are kind of broad scale recommendations that I'll introduce briefly and then discuss in greater detail from the perspective of what our vision would be for New Brunswick once the plan is complete. Um, so first, we'd like to see an increase in the emphasis on adaptation, specifically nature-based adaptation. Um, there, are, there were a few action items in the current plan related to nature-based solutions, uh, but making it a significant priority, I think that we can unlock the many co-benefits that we talked about earlier all across the province. Um, and we also need to understand where our intact wetlands, our coastlines, and our other natural assets are so we can protect them as well as where we can expect the largest impacts from climate change in the short term to be. Um, so we need to understand exactly where we're most at risk and where we can have the greatest impact in order to act effectively. Um, we also need to, um, you know, we think there's an opportunity with this plan to prioritize building climate literacy and capacity among new audiences, government departments, um, et cetera. And by doing this, we'll be able to identify new and innovative approaches to adaptation while strengthening our social capital and developing strong institutions to respond to emergencies and other challenges. And finally, through the work that I've done and, and the many different groups that we've worked with over the past um, you know, six or seven years, I think that we're, I'm feeling like we're at the stage where we need a greater emphasis to be placed on how communities and groups are going to access larger pools of funding to get this adaptation work done. Um, so as you've heard already, the adaptation is expensive, um, and while there's a lot of innovative ways that we can fund projects, um, that's not always accessible to certain groups. And we have a number of examples from all across the province, if you think back to the map that I showed earlier, of, of ideas and really, really smart solutions that can be scaled up. And so by fostering some of this collaboration and adjusting current funding models, I think that we could really in this plan start to focus on how do we take all those really interesting pilot projects and scale them up um, so that we can produce big wins for New Brunswick in, in the coming years. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. So d in terms of our vision, um, so this is really what, what, what do we see coming out of this plan um, if all these recommendations were be, to be adopted? So what we see is we envision, you know, the adoption of nature-based climate solutions, as I've talked about, um, and we see this that has been uh, rapidly accelerated. Um, we can imagine that we have peatlands in eastern New Brunswick that are protected from extraction. Um, avoiding um, a, a large amount of, um, of carbon pollution going into the atmosphere. Um, we see uh, opportunities to have old growth forests protected to act as a sponge on the landscape to slow down floodwaters. Uh, we have agricultural producers who adopt new best management practices to increase buffer widths. Um, and there's many, many other examples of this. Uh, and we can go to the next slide, please. Um, another part of our vision, uh, we envision that high risk areas have been identified um, all along the coast, all along our rivers and, and, and inside of the province as well. And that we've taken the time and effort to identify where people in our infrastructure are at highest risk. Um, and we've, we've heard from many other presenters that this is definitely a need. Um, and we also envision that we're using the precautionary principle to say, okay, we should assume there's some risk along the coast and along our rivers given the uncertainty of climate change. And we need to help ensure people um, you know, don't build there if they are building there, that there's some, there's some restrictions there so that we're not putting people at undue risk. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we believe this would be done through, you know, new regulations aimed at protecting critical infrastructure in people's lives, but also protecting things like coastal wetlands and healthy dunes and beaches that um, can help act as that buffer between ourselves and, and some of these impacts. So we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next, we would envision that after this plan is implemented, that we've taken steps to identify you know, where these key ecosystems are. So where are the ecosystems that we want to actually protect that are going to give us the biggest benefit um, in the future? We need to do some work to identify where those are. And once we do that, um, we need to take you know, strong measures to be able to protect and steward those areas so that they can contribute to the mitigation and adaptation efforts that we're talking about. Um, and this has a huge potential uh, to help New Brunswick mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, there's a recent study that was uh, put out by Nature United, um, a national conservation group in Canada, um, that found that New Brunswick actually has the strongest potential for mitigation using the nature-based climate solutions approach than any other province in Atlantic Canada. And two of the really um, strong opportunities or pathways, as they've described them, for this uh, fell under improved forest management as well as um, protecting coastal wetlands. Um, and so if we're thinking about impacts, we also have to think about how the landscape can help us. Um, so we know from lessons learned in BC from this fall that the massive forest fires in the summer and the forest management system contributed to major flooding. 
Um, and we have to remember that everything is connected. So when we change the landscape um, in the upper part of our watersheds, we can expect to see those impacts downstream. So thinking and planning from that watershed-based perspective um, can also be really important and valuable when we're thinking about nature-based solutions. Um, we go to the next slide, please. And so another piece that, that we envision is that we have continued and um, expanded opportunities for collaboration. And so we need to take every opportunity that we can as a province to build that social capital and strong institutions with all of our partners and stakeholders and rights holders that, um, especially those that we've learned during the pandemic in terms of how we work together and how we respond to crisis um, and apply those learnings to climate change. And so we would think that the plan should make every effort to include and involve and learn from um, all of our different um, perspectives and, and folks that live in our province. And, and especially in a lot of ways, these people that are on kind of the front lines of climate change and will be able to help problem solve and respond to challenges going forward. Um, and so it, just as a couple of examples, you know, we need to have systems in place to allow for this collaboration to occur. Um, so for example, we heard from uh, Jamie Burke, the town of Sackville that um, you know, about the Shignecto Climate Change Adaptation Collaborative, uh, which is a group of, you know, multiple different stakeholders who have come together to, you know, discuss climate change on a regular basis and talk about issues in the Shignecto region and, and how they can respond collectively. Um, other examples might include, you know, setting up regional climate change EMO staff uh, through the province who would serve as kind of local liaisons to support collaboration on climate change issues related to public safety and health, for example. So we need to really start to think, you know, how can we um, expand these opportunities and bring more people in. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, as I mentioned before, we, we have the solutions. Uh, we know a lot about them. We know their benefit and we have the groups that can do them. And we heard a lot about capacity, especially in the earlier um, part of the, um, of the presentations last week. And so, you know, one of the challenges that we face now, of course, that I mentioned is the ca that of capacity and scale. So how do we move nature-based coastal restoration projects, for example, from a few sites in the southeast and northeast to other locations? Or how do we take learnings from the naturalized stormwater ponds in Moncton and apply them, uh, you know, in Edmonston or, or Shippigan or Miramichi? Um, and how do we take lessons learned in the kind of cases with riparian restoration, for example, and apply that to, for instance, the potato belt? Um, so more funding and facilitated collaborations really needed between all of our partners to get this work done. Um, and as I mentioned before, it would be great if we could explore ways where funding models could be updated, um, perhaps the dedicated funding stream for large scale expensive projects that complement um, existing programs like ETF um, with a particular focus on scaling up work that we know has been successful and is already getting the job done um, in the province. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. And finally, um, you know, as a, as a education or a organization that's rooted in education, we really envision um, an, an engaged government that has all of its departments talking about climate change and working on solutions together. Um, we envision clear communication and tools like the flood hazard mapping that came out this week um, that can be shared with people so they can make informed decisions about risk. Um, and really, at the end of the day, we need to have people talking at their supper tables and on the snowmobile and ATV trails about climate change in New Brunswick. And so by working across government departments and with partners and sharing stories, we, we really think this can lead to you know, greater awareness and hopefully in turn more individual action taken. So whether this be through you know, increased transparency about what we're doing um, as a province to respond to climate change, or whether this being you know, a, a really strong emphasis on working with um, you know, our education institutions to enhance climate change education, um, all of these things can be really important. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. And so just as a quick review, you know, these are our, our big ticket items in terms of what we see as the opportunities for the updated climate plan. Um, really thinking about this focus on nature-based adaptation, nature-based climate solutions as a cost-effective um, strategy that can not only reduce the impacts of climate change, but also protect um, our vulnerable communities that we know are at risk. Um, taking the time to really identify where are we most at risk? And we've heard about this a lot already. Um, and also identify where are these natural areas that can provide us with the greatest potential for uh, protection and restoration that will enhance our ability to adapt. Um, and then of course, building the climate literacy, which I spoke about, uh, building that strong social capital and innovating our funding approaches, we think are, are some, of the, um, some of the nice opportunities that can come with, with this work that we're doing together. Um, and so we can go to the next slide, please. 
And I will just wrap up there. I'm, ha I'm again, happy to answer um, any questions and have some discussion at this point. Um, but as many of the other speakers have pointed out as well, you know, we're very willing to, um, you know, continue the conversation at any time. So feel free to reach out at any point um, to discuss, you know, some of the, what we were talking about today, but also other work that we're doing. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cheeseman. Uh, we'll now move into our question period. Uh, uh, Madame Landry, you have the parole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cheeseman, uh, for being here. Uh, what you're doing is obviously very important for New Brunswick, and uh, I would like to commend on on your um, on your work. Uh, that you're doing. I believe it's all voluntary. Is it uh, voluntary in all the clubs that people that are uh, doing what they're doing? Yes, yeah. So we have, um, we have, as I mentioned, we represent kind of 14 different nature clubs from across the province and that those are yeah, all um, volunteers that, um, you know, contribute to our various conservation projects and education projects. And at Nature and Bee as an organization ourselves, we're, um, you know, governed by a volunteer board of directors, and we have about uh, 10 full-time staff um, who work uh, on our various different projects. Um, yes, yeah, so we've grown a lot over the over the years, but definitely our roots are in um, our nature clubs and and those uh, those volunteers that exist in all of our communities around the province for sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, would Would you be able? I, I'm just trying to figure out: uh, Is there a club in the northwestern area of New Brunswick, in the Edmundston area? Yes, yes, we have a club. Um, we have um, the uh, Matawaska. We have a club for Matawaska. Um, and we also have another club that's actually just, I guess, is a bit south of where you are. But we have another club that's just being formed in, um, in Carlson County as well. So, yes, okay. but we, we do have some representation up there for sure. Um, and would you uh, give me an idea of how the clubs are funded and uh, do they have? both provincial and federal uh, funding coming through? Yeah, so it, uh, it kind of depends and varies on the different um, clubs. So some of our nature clubs um, would apply for some provincial funding, for example, through um, the Environmental Trust Fund or through the New Brunswick Wildlife Trust Fund for kind of special projects that they work on. Um, so I can think of an example, um, you know, for instance, in the St. John region, our St. John Naturalist Club um, has applied for some funding this year for a couple of special projects related to some bird monitoring work that they um, have wanted to do in their region. Um, and so there are clubs that do kind of pursue those opportunities. Um, we at Nature and Bee offer in in insurance for our clubs and kind of staff support for some of the events that they want to run and that sort of thing. But um, for the most part, our clubs are uh, are completely volunteer, yeah. Okay. So when you're talking about the 10 full-time staff, are they all located in Fredericton? Uh, we're located actually all across the province. And um, we have uh, one of our staff in uh, just outside of Woodstock, uh, myself in Sackville. Um, we have staff in the Canadian Peninsula um, and uh, Moncton as well as Fredericton. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there, would you be aware of uh, policies or program or legislation uh, that exists in other provinces that would be or might be beneficial for uh, for New Brunswick to consider. Yeah, well, I think from the perspective of um, from the perspective of this uh, nature-based climate solutions piece, I think one of the big things that we could do as a province is start to incorporate um, this idea of maintaining our natural ecosystems and our natural areas for. Um, uh, for adaptation and mitigation in our in provincial statements of interest and so that would kind of set the policy direction for um, you know for what people are going to be working on in the province so that, that's one piece um, and I think another piece is you know thinking and looking to other jurisdictions that have strong um, coastal protection policies that would uh, you know be strong enough to be able to say well you know maybe we shouldn't be um, having development this close to the coast or maybe we need to be considering you know, what is that coastal wetland or what is that coastal feature, whether it be a beach or a dune or a coastal wetland doing for, um, you know, the broader community in terms of, you know, buffering them from the impacts of climate change or, you know, providing, um, you know, fish nursery area, for example, for the fisheries industry. Um, you know, wh what are some of those areas doing um, that are, you know, for the public good 
Um, and should we direct development away or change the way that we are allowing um, development to happen in the province um, so that we're protecting some of those important services that we're getting, um, whether it be from the perspective of climate change or from or from other perspectives. So I would say those two for sure um, in terms of mm -hmm. looking at um, and looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, what your actions are, are they based on research or on uh, volunteers' uh, willingness to, uh, you know, uh, undertake certain, uh, you know, different types of work. How do you research what your um, your actions are, are are going towards? Is is on what is it based mainly? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so a lot of our projects are based off of, um, you know, needs that have come from. Um, some of those grassroots clubs and some from, from from some from our members in terms of what they what they're seeing on the landscape and a lot of perspectives what we talk about in HMB a lot is that you know our naturalists and our volunteers are kind of the eyes and the ears on the ground and they can tell us uh, you know what's going on but a lot of our work especially our climate change adaptation work is really grounded in um, in research and so one of the things you know nature-based climate solutions is really kind of an emerging um, an emerging topic as it comes to uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation um, kind of globally but also here in Canada um, and so we have um, you know really been doing a lot of digging into this in the last few years and kind of working with other groups who have um, you know a lot of capacity with doing some of the on the ground work so whether it be some of uh, our local watershed group partners um, or other um, NGOs who who have the expertise in you know ecosystem uh, restoration and, and doing some of the work on the ground and figuring out together okay how do we how do we do this for new brunswick or how do we want to adapt this for new brunswick so we're always keeping our, our eyes and ears out for um for new initiatives that are happening in other parts of the country um and trying to understand how those how we could bring those there to or here rather to to kind of advance action so for sure it's um yeah i'd say it's a mix of that in terms of the projects that we ultimately decide to work on it's really grounded in research and science as well as um as well as the perspective of uh, of our members and volunteers for sure um would something like uh, the um, uh, actual federal government uh, engagement to uh, i don't know if if it's the correct word but to plant trees in canada like two billion trees uh that was uh, um, something that uh, the Trudeau government, uh, you know, announced and that they would do, and the result is uh, is really only 8.5 million. So, uh, would that type of activity be interesting for you, or is it something that uh, you know to plant trees? I would say it's keeping biodiversity probably, and uh, would that be the type of uh, projects that could uh, interest your um, your organization? For sure, yeah, and I think from the um, from the nature-based climate solution side of things, I mean, one of the one of the big things that um, is talked about, uh, in particular in the in the Nature United report that I that I mentioned, is the opportunity for um, for both protection and restoration to occur. So you know, we're really big on the yeah. on the idea that you know we need to be pursuing opportunities for ecosystem restoration, including, um, you know, tree planting and, and forest regeneration. Um, there's, you know, it gets complicated as we start to talk about, you know, how that's done in terms of, you know, where should we be planting these trees? What types mm -hmm. of trees should we be planting? What kind of species? But, um, you know, a big piece of, of the nature-based climate solutions piece is around, um, you know, first of all, protecting old growth forest um, as that is a you know a really key contributor to the adaptation and mitigation potential for forests, um, you know doing some of that forest restoration, especially in suburban and urban landscapes, um, and so um, you know at at a high level, yes, it's definitely you know an initiative that we support and, and we would agree with, and 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 so in terms of um, you know doing that 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 tree planting, but I think that you know there are um, ways in which we can just maximize the impact of that type of project for sure so it's definitely definitely a, a solution and kind of an approach that we uh, would be supportive of uh, certainly and then it would be a matter of you know kind of working out the details i guess on on what that would look like and how we can kind of have the biggest impact with it all right i guess i have the time for a, a last questions uh, um, 
Oh, sorry, <laughs> Rachel. Um, what uh, what do you believe should the province top priorities be in addressing climate change? Yeah, so generally speaking, I think that um, you know, a number of the suggestions that I made during the presentation um, are where we're kind of thinking. But at a high level, I think you know, really starting to think about what, what role could our natural areas play? So how can we increase the protection of natural assets? How can we incorporate um, you know, looking at natural assets and looking at what is on the landscape and how it's protecting us um, in things like land use planning, um, in new regulation, or at least enabling, uh, you know, local governments and municipalities to, to look at that as well. Um, as I mentioned, you know, involving that uh, messaging into the provincial statements of interest to make sure that we're maintaining our natural areas um, for the benefit of uh, climate change adaptation. Um, and then focusing on identifying those, those high risk areas uh, where we want to really prioritize work into the future. So coming back to what's been spoken about many times before in other presentations about that adaptation planning um, and prioritization. Thank okay. you very much. Merci, Madame Landry. Uh, okay, Mr. Kuhn, the floor is now yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, Mr. Tiesman. Um, thank you for your recommendations and the way you've uh, kind of laid them out here in the, in the vision of where, uh, where it would be good to get to. Um, with respect to identifying high risk areas, um, what um, process can you imagine should be used to, to do that? Like how do you, how, how would that be operationalized? Who would carry it out or at least who would Let's say who would lead and coordinate it, and and, and how would you see it um, being implemented? For sure, yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah, and I think you know it's a challenging exercise for sure. And I think one of the big pieces that would need to be involved with it is, is kind of working directly with with communities, and I think bringing them along the way and having them play a role or play uh, you know a leadership or coordination role within it. Um, I think that a big piece is really going to be focused around how do we how do we prioritize um, some of these areas? We know even from the you know the flood hazard mapping tool that came out this week that we're gonna we have a lot of places that are of high risk, and you know the province has already gone through and and um, identified some of those high risk communities from from that perspective and and prioritized some of the adaptation plans um, for those areas. And so I think we have to look at a number of things. We have to kind of look at you know what are the current um, projections in terms of climate change um, and get those as up to date as possible to say okay here. Here are some of the places, um, some of the communities that we know that are going to be facing, um, you know, some of the greatest impacts, whether it be from sea level rise or coastal erosion or from inland flooding. Um, and then I think it's a matter of working with those communities very, very closely to say, um, you know, that we, we want to work together um, on, on finding some solutions and, and understanding where these risks are. Um, so I think as a starting place, that, that is where I would, I would recommend starting. Uh, and in terms of leadership, I think that it really needs to come from um, from the provincial level, and then and and really involve those communities all, from the outset all along the way. Um, so it's never thought of as um, you know something that's happening without them, um, because obviously it's, it's it's tied to you know a lot of feelings of um, you know as we've talked about, or as some of the other speakers have talked about earlier. You know, it's a really challenging uh, situation to talk about risk and talk about. Um, you know where we have some of our infrastructure and where we have some of our homes, um, but it, you know it's a, so it's a conversation that needs to involve everybody for sure. Um, I would say. Would you would you see a role for the regional service commissions in actually carrying, uh, sort of, um, uh, spearheading uh, uh, the, the carrying out of these risk assessments uh, at the local level? For sure, and I think we, we, we have some examples of that in terms of what um, you know in the southeast, for example, the uh, taking on. Um, you know, like a, a rural adaptation plan, for example, or, or and and kind of more of a regional approach, uh, for example, in Kent. And so I think that that you know the regional service commissions could play a really strong role in supporting that um, with their strong connections, obviously, to the to the communities themselves. Um, and so yeah, that, certainly that would be a good um, a good partner to involve as well in that work in terms of again having all of these different levels of expertise and kind of levels of scale involved in this planning work to identify where some of those high risk places are. In your third recommendation um, around the, the idea of key making sure key ecosystems are protected and stored and, 
and contribute to uh, both mitigation and adaptation efforts. Um, in, in formulating that, do you see or did you see the need for new legislation? Uh, and if so, in particular, what or or improvements to existing legislation or regulations? And if so, uh, which ones? For sure, yeah, I think that it would be great to see some leadership on some new regulation around recognizing the importance of um, some of these key ecosystems like coastal wetlands, for example, in our forests and, and our uh, you know, natural coastlines and dune systems, for instance, to say, you know, to have regulation that does offer protection for those, those ecosystems in, in a real way that says, you know, we recognize that this system not only um, is important for biodiversity and for our wildlife, but it's also providing these services that are um, you know, beneficial for all New Brunswickers. Um, so whether that be through, you know, increased access to recreation for physical and mental health, or whether that be through buffering the impacts of climate change, et cetera. So I think that having regulation that really spells out that, you know, we recognize as a province that these places are important uh, and that we have uh, protections in place that are going to limit um, the effects that uh, our uh, future development projects or, or similar um, type of things have on these spaces, I think is gonna be really important going forward. Um, and because, because again, it, it not only um, protects those communities and those areas that are uh, most at risk that you know, are already benefiting from these systems, but by, leave, by, by kind of actively um, stewarding these, these spaces and by protecting them, we're also you know, increasing our adaptive capacity and resilience in terms of being able to rely on them uh, into the future. So definitely, um, you know, opportunities for new regu regulation around there. From kind of a policy point of view, I think, again, coming back to the provincial statements of interest is, is a really key piece um, in terms of kind of setting the tone and setting the direction for um, this work in terms of um, looking at climate change adaptation and um, how we can work with nature to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of pieces um, that are within that. And I guess I would also, you know, encourage looking at some existing regulation or and yeah and also policy i guess as well to think about you know where are there some gaps or where are there some areas that we can fill that um would prioritize some of this work kind of across other government departments as well um, so that everybody's kind of working off the same uh, playbook or working on the same page when it comes to nature-based climate solutions so would you see uh, the climate change secretary taking the lead on this to get it done or would it be something that needs to uh, be mandated to the Minister of Natural Resources and Energy, for example? Yeah, well, I think that's a really great question. Um, I think that, you know, the Secretariat um, has a, you know, has played a, a great role in kind of um, encouraging and enhancing the opportunities for looking at natural infrastructure and nature-based climate solutions in, in um, up to this point. Um, and I think it, it, in, in the context of this plan, what we really need is, is to show that that strong leadership is there. So if, if, if it's something that, you know, the Secretariat can take on in their role, that's great. But I, I, I do also believe um, that there should be that kind of leadership from the government side as well to say, um, you know, we, we really recognize that this is a priority, um, that we find ourselves in a situation where we need to respond um, to climate change in kind of innovative ways. And that we're, you know, really uh, blessed with um, a, a province that has a lot of these intact um, kind of ecosystem still in place that, that can be uh, protected with, with new regulations. So I guess I, I would answer that in terms of encouraging on both sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, on, uh, on number five, um, you say that there are innovative funding models that have helped scale up successful solutions. Um, can, can you just give us a little bit of a flavor of the, of the solutions that you've seen or you believe are six have been successful that that uh, they can get scaled up for sure yes um yeah so the i mean there's examples that um you know there were some really exciting examples of things that are happening across the province so we have um for example in the southeast and the northeast some watershed groups that have really taken the idea of living shorelines um and have tried to and are trying and being successful at um increasing um you know expertise and capacity related to that so living shorelines being um, you know, steps that individual landowners or, um, you know, other um, um, other entities can take, for example, um, you know, departments of transportation infrastructure, if they're thinking about work they're going to be doing along the coast on roadways, um, that 
incorporate um, living elements into uh, shoreline protection. So whether that be uh, planting native species to help anchor some of the sediment in the soil, whether that be um, you know a hybrid solution of using some rock and interplanting um, you know grasses and shrubs in there to help anchor some of that. So thinking about those solutions are, are one of the um, one of the big opportunities I see in terms of being scaled up. Um, others include um, you know work that's happening, for instance, in the Kennebecasis watershed uh, through the Kennebecasis watershed restoration committee with some of the work that they're doing. Uh, restoring riparian areas um, and buffer areas on um, in agricultural areas, um, and so helping uh, you know farmers and producers reduce risks of erosion in terms of losing um, viable land that they would uh, be able to produce um, food on. Um, and I think another big one for me too is is this idea of the naturalized stormwater ponds in our kind of larger um, you know urban center uh, urban urban centers and towns. Um, and I think specifically with naturalized stormwater ponds, what I find really interesting about those um, are that it really takes this idea that we've had for a long time about how we need to manage stormwater in our towns and cities, um, but really started to incorporate that natural element into it. And that's when we really start to see the benefit in terms of all these co-benefits. You know, Jamie Burke from the town of Sackville talked about, you know, the, storm, the naturalized stormwater pond in Sackville and how it also is a recreation trail, uh, how it also, you know, has engaged a lot of the youth in the community through the school um, and you know provide education opportunities and you don't get that with something like a water jail as we call them where you know we just have a, a concrete detention pond or you know where our culvers run into so I think that there's a big piece around um, being able to find out you know some of these examples of these types of things that are working and although that they're complicated and they're difficult to fund in the first place um, I think the more that we're able to recognize um, that some of this work is happening across the province and that there is this opportunity um, to use expertise that we're developing here in New Brunswick to expand this out further. That, that's where I really see um, that opportunity for scaling up for, for some of those projects. I'm happy to give more examples too, um, if it'd be helpful. And um, maybe I'll just take a second here to also just to note that I am going to share uh, with the committee kind of a list of links and resources that a lot of this, um, this thinking is connected to and in that, um, there'll be a lot of other examples of those nature-based climate solutions that, that you can take a look at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Mr. Austin, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cheeseman, for being here today and uh, presenting um, a little bit about what you do and the importance of it. Um, I just want to take a minute, I guess, and, and focus on uh, the education side of it. And I, I guess I'd like to know do you work or collaborate at all with uh, the education department or um, with particular schools or whatnot to to do the the education programming? Yes. Yeah, so at Nature and B, we work with um, a number of schools from all across the province. Um, our education department's um, based out of our Fredericton office, and we have relationships with um, you know teachers and administrators and schools um, in uh, you know districts all across the province. Um, and we have a number of education programs um, that fall under, you know, both the work that we're talking about today in terms of climate change, but also, um, you know, general uh, nature education. Um, in the northeast part of the province, where we have our big focus on piping plover and species at risk, we have um, a lot of uh, work that our uh, species at risk coordinator does in schools up there as well. Um, so we do have those relationships. And one thing that we've also worked on uh, from the climate change side in the last couple of years through um, through the New Brunswick Environmental Network as well, is really started to think about how can we help support our educators that are working in the formal education system on climate change education um, and allow them, um, you know, to give some of those tools that um, would help them share information and, and learning in their classrooms. Um, and that really came from the, the youth climate strikes. Um, in, in 2019 and 2018 and so that that was a big impetus for that work and that's when we really started to hear from teachers and hear from other educators that you know we want to be able to teach climate change in our classrooms and we want more of that um, because that's what that's what we're hearing from the youth so it's definitely a big priority for us for sure i appreciate that and i'm I just being a father of three and understanding a little bit of how kids think and and operate and learn a lot of them uh, are very hands-on and, and and practical and kind of seeing it for themselves um, does uh, does your organization do anything with uh, particular classes in either high schools or middle schools 
even elementary schools, I guess, for that matter, that would do like uh, any type of tours of say wetlands or uh, certain environmental uh, spots where, you know, they can kind of see for themselves and get an explanation of a little bit about their environment locally. Is there anything like that in, in practical terms that your organization does? Yeah, for sure. So we have um, a number of resources that we use with classrooms for that specifically. And in the past we've done, um, you know, and, and our partners as well that we've worked with have offered uh, field trips like that. You know, a lot of our work in the last, I would say, three or four years has focused on um, you build in that capacity and doing some of those similar type of idea, um, but with adults uh, in the professional sector. So for engineers and land use planners and for um, for nonprofits. But, you know, a big priority for us has always been, um, you know, working outdoors um, with children. And so that that's a big piece for sure. And so we, we do have some of those um, resources available and in recent times as well. Um, we've also developed through, um, you know, through our partners and through our collaborative projects, um, you know, a number of videos and kind of virtual site tours as well um, that are accessible um, on online through our different channels uh, that, that folks can use as kind of a virtual field trip as well <laughs> to, to visit some of these sites. But yes, we definitely certainly have programs that, that we can run um, with classrooms for sure to kind of bring uh, bring students out um, and bring other folks out as well to show them uh, and talk about things kind of in a more hands-on way for sure. Yeah, perfect. I appreciate that. Um, in your presentation, uh, part of the uh, cycle that you have there and what we do, um, you talk about conservation planning and species at risk. And I'd like to just take a moment to kind of focus on the species at risk part in relation to uh, climate change as it is now and, and I guess the effects and what's projected to come, what do you see as being, uh, and, and just locally here in New Brunswick, what, what do you see as being one of the species or several of the species that are most at risk that, um, that I guess maybe keeps folks, uh, environmental folks up at night? Yes. Well, the list is the list is quite large, um, but I will highlight a few for sure. So, in terms of some of our um, some of our work that we're doing now um, through our Healthy Coasts and Bee project that I mentioned earlier, that's um, funded both with um, uh, federal and provincial funding, and and that really focuses on a lot of our coastal associated species at risk, um, particularly in the eastern part of the province. Um, so, you know, Acadian Peninsula, Miramichi Bay, and and down into the southeast. Um, and there's a number of species, you know, there's the piping plover, which a lot of us are probably familiar with, uh, one of our more iconic species at risk that Nature and Bee has been working on for um, just over two years, or two decades, sorry. Um, so that's a, a migratory shorebird that nests on um, New Brunswick's beaches. Um, we also have a number of kind of rare and endemic plant species like the Gulf of St. Lawrence aster and beach pinweed, um, which uh, colonize on, on dune systems. Um, so those ones are obviously at risk from things like coastal erosion and sea level rise. Uh, and we also have, of course, um, the endemic butterfly, the maritime ringlet in the Schiller region, um, which is also, you know, discussed a lot as being at risk from, from some of these coastal uh, climate change impacts. Um, and one of the other uh, projects we've been working on that I mentioned as well over the last couple of years, which has been a really kind of an interesting one for us, has been our work um, in the Wollastook St. John River watershed in kind of the agricultural areas. And so in that project, you know, we talk about um, bobolink and some other grassland nesting birds and how, um, you know, certain practices may be impacting them, but also, you know, how, how might climate change um, and, and changes in temperature and precipitation patterns um, impact those birds that are nesting in our fields, um, as well as some of our turtle species as well. So, um, yeah, so there's a number of species for sure. Um, and when it comes to climate change, that those kind of perspectives and those impacts are, are just kind of starting to come up more and more, I find, in, in our conservation planning exercises. And so it's sort of kind of an exciting piece, as though, as well, because we're starting to see really those connections between what I've been talking about, the nature-based climate solutions, and opportunities to protect species at risk. So if we're thinking about, you know, coastal wetlands, again, for an example, um, you know, by protecting those spaces, not only are we getting the benefit of um, you know, how acting as that buffer between us and some of those impacts, but we're also, you know, protecting some of that habitat for these really important and really iconic species that I think a lot of New Brunswick critters kind of resonate with and, and understand and can identify with. So that's another big, you know, added co-benefit of, of this type of approach for sure. Great, I appreciate that. Um, and with the species at risk and, and some of the work that your group does with that, 
uh, do you collaborate with the Department of Environment or some other government agency to kind of uh, either share data and information, uh, provide recommendations or some feedback? Um, how, how close is the collaboration with your organization and, and say any government entity or is, is it kind of non-existent? Like where, where, uh, where's the two together or are they together at all? For sure, yeah. So we work very closely with um, both the Department of Natural Resources, Energy Development, and um, Environment and Local Government on, I would say, all of our projects. Um, there's usually, you know, usually we have representation from, um, well, both provincial and federal levels of government on a number of our, um, a number of our conservation planning projects and species at risk project and climate change projects. So, whether it be the Climate Change Secretariat or, you know, the Source and Surface Water Branch at ELG. Um, or the biodiversity section um, at Natural Resource and Energy Development, we do have a really strong um, working relationship with each one of those departments for sure. Okay, well, thank you again, Mr. Cheeseman and uh, Mr. Chair. That's all the questions I have. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Austin. Um, Ms. Bacchus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Cheeseman, for appearing this morning and giving us all this wonderful information. Um, I was just wondering, um, in your summation, you said that the climate plan opportunities, one of them was to identify natural assets by the greatest, ap sorry, adaptation potential and, prior and prioritize for protection. I'm getting a bit of feedback. Um, have you got any specific recommendations or have you already identified some of those uh, places? There's no sense. Uh, reinventing the wheel if you have and I don't expect you to to provide us with a list right now but can you provide that list uh, if you do have some and would you be looking for funding for this inventory or are you going to ask um, uh, public stakeholders to identify the sensitive areas yeah that's a that's a wonderful question um, yes so I think that there has been a lot of work that has been done to start to identify um, where these kind of ecosystems where, that, where it, they provide the highest potential for our um, nature-based climate solutions. Um, there's been a lot of work done, I would say, nationally to look at, you know, where our biggest pathways or opportunities kind of within Canada. Um, and I think, you know, we're starting to drill down a little bit more um, at a provincial level. Um, so, for instance, in the Nature United report that I'd mentioned, you know, they talk about, um, you know, the two biggest um, opportunities for New Brunswick is the improved forest management and the um, protection of peatlands that haven't been harvested in order to avoid that um, from a mitigation perspective. Um, in terms of the work that we've done, um, or uh, a few years ago now, we kind of undertook an exercise to try to identify, you know, how we could look for um, some of these habitats and some of these ecosystems that might be providing, you know, a lot of high value. Um, there's also, you know, existing resources that the province does have um, in terms of, um, you know, some some of the layers that are available on GUNB, for example, that can help us with this as well. Um, but I think what's needed is kind of an opportunity to take a step back and say, okay, we really want to be intentional about finding where these areas are. Um, and so we need to kind of pull in all the information that, that currently exists. Um, and then identify where those gaps are for where we need to collect more information and then really uh, prioritize those. So I think that it would take, um, you know, take that opportunity to kind of pull all the different stakeholders who've been kind of working on this work together, take that step back and take a, take a high level look at, at where we're at right now um, and then identify those gaps like I mentioned. So in terms of the, the funding um, opportunities, for sure that would be you know, a big opportunity, I think, for not only our organization, but all the organizations that kind of work on this file um, across the province to kind of have that opportunity to really start to take this seriously. And I think a recognition from the perspective of, um, of government that this is a, a direction that we want to go in terms of really seriously looking at nature-based climate solutions and understand, um, you know, where there are those big opportunities would be really a, a great um, a great way forward, I think, um, in terms of being able to get that work started. Okay, thank you. And I was thinking more of geographic areas that would need to be identified. And with with all your volunteers in so many parts of the province, I thought perhaps you may have already started that work and then you could provide that work. So that's my question or my questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Minister Crosman. Great. And thank you, Adam, as well, for your great presentation today. We're learning so much from each and every uh, presentation. It's uh, certainly appreciated. Just a couple of questions I do have. Um, could you summarize what you see your role going forward and where we can help specifically when it regards to education and outreach uh, for your nature, regarding your nature-based solutions? We may have covered some of this already, but just trying to get a handle on that, please. For sure, yeah. So in terms of the education perspective, I think, um, you know, coming from a, from a background in, in environmental education, I think one of the biggest things we need is to really start to think about um, what we call kind of as a knowledge or information um, deficit where we, we don't want to just be focusing on giving people information. Um, we want to really be focusing on, you know, how do we raise a level of awareness and a level of um, of kind of self-efficacy that, you know, people feel like they can do something and that there's a tangible thing they can do. Um, and so we have a couple of initiatives that we're kind of working on right now that are really focused on, um, you know, communicating with people about um, nature-based climate solutions, but from a perspective of, okay, here's what you can do on your own property or here's what you can do as an individual um, to do these things. So I think anything that we can do to kind of share those stories uh, and be clear about communicating what, um, you know, what people can do would be really effective. Um, another thing that, you know, from, from that perspective that we can um, really uh, benefit from is having climate change education really integrated into all of our, um, our post-secondary institutions as well. So if we think about all of our professional programs that, you know, our different post-secondary institutions offer, whether it be through the community colleges or through some of the universities we have, um, in the province, things like nursing and healthcare and engineering, um, we really need to be having everybody talking about this, and we need to have everybody recognizing that um, you know have a basic climate change 101 kind of background, but then also you know diving into some of these more um, more um, you know collaborative topics like nature-based climate solutions that we're all kind of on the same page. So I would say, you know, definitely working um, to support that integration of climate change education across. The various sectors so it's not just if you're taking a natural resource degree that you learn about this for example um, and also um, yeah really thinking about how can we um, offer opportunities for our youth and for others um, to not only just learn about the knowledge but engage with um, some of the understandings of what they can do as an individual yeah certainly understanding for sure because as MLA we all get calls for office each and every day uh, looking for direction in this case as well with the flood mapping coming out uh, last week will give people a better understanding of, uh, of, you know, the area they live in, I guess. Uh, another question for you. Uh, what, if any, barriers exist to gaining broader acceptance for your nature-based solutions? Do you have any barriers there that stand out? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've learned from the work that we've done in terms of um, nature-based climate solutions over the years is it's, it's a difficult thing to... Um, kind of put on a map, I'll say. So because uh, of the inherent kind of complexity of natural processes and ecosystems, and so it's it's a challenging thing to say, okay, yes, this piece of coastal wetland or this particular forest is um, is of greater importance than this one kind of next door. And so that's why, you know, we would really advocate that we really need to start from a perspective of recognizing that all of these ecosystem types are going to be very important for us moving forward. And that we really, you know, knowing the situation that we're in and that we're going to continue down the road to moving um, around, we really need to prioritize protecting and restoring um, and actively managing as much of these areas as we can um, and kind of taking that precautionary approach that I mentioned before. So thinking, you know, assuming that we're at some level of risk or assuming that there's going to be some level of benefit if we do undertake um, some, some protection or some restoration um, would be a great benefit. But I think that is the biggest barrier is kind of really continuing to understand how we can actually, um, you know, identify these areas. And so I think that's, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to include that as part of kind of what we envisioned in this plan is I think we do have the expertise and we do have the capacity to do that. Um, it's just a matter of kind of getting all those people together, like I said, um, and really starting to prioritize that over the next uh, over the next few years. Okay, it's great, and good to hear you working uh, well with our department as well as uh, NRED. And uh, you're looking for more ways of finding more mitigation, uh, or maybe better ways of using your funding. Um, you mentioned about between departments. I will tell you that the the premier has a one government approach, one GNB, where all uh, departments work together. Uh, regarding the funding coming out for various projects through climate change fund 
and uh, there's some, a lot of good things happening there. But the Environmental Trust Fund, almost every speaker has spoken of using or applying for money. Can you give me, is there a couple or three examples of how Nature NB has benefited from the Environmental Trust Fund projects? Certainly, yes. Um, we have many examples over the years, um, and we're very fortunate to have this type of model um, in the province, as, as, um, as you all know. Um, yeah, so for many years, we've been benefiting from the Environmental Trust Fund for a number of our projects, including our um, Species at Risk uh, program in the Northeast that I've mentioned a few times with our piping plover work, um, our climate change work with nature-based climate solutions, for sure. We benefited from um, ETF funding as well. Um, and we have a number of citizen science um, and stewardship initiatives that kind of engage our nature clubs uh, that we were talking about earlier in um, in our work. And so whether that be you know volunteers going out to do some bird monitoring or going out to do um, kind of volunteering with um, um, yeah with engaging with protected areas, um, there's a number and kind of a whole suite of projects that we've um, that we benefited through ETF for in the past for sure. Well, was well, so you had a great presentation. Appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate your enthusiasm as well with uh, Nature NB and the, the work you do. So thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Cheeseman, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to make any closing comments that you may wish. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you uh, for the opportunity. You know, this is a really great um, a great forum to be able to hear about some of the work that's happening in the province. And I hope I kind of gave a bit of a snapshot in terms of um, you know, not only the work that we're doing, but also the work that we're supporting in terms of the, all of the different groups that are active in the province on climate change um, and gave a bit of an insight into that. Um, again, just encourage, um, you know, members of the committee to please get in touch with us if you'd like to learn more. And as I mentioned, I'll follow up with them um, with some resources and some links that will get into kind of some more specifics around um, some of the nature-based climate solutions perspectives that I talked about. Um, and yeah, really just open and willing to collaborate um, and just as a, you know, just a constant reminder that, you know, we're here um, for for uh, for advice and kind of assistance and always a willing partner um, and that, you know, adaptation and mitigation, um, you know, are very, very important. And I think it's really about finding, again, those win-win approaches is where, where can we, you know, invest in an adaptation or mitigation project that's also going to get us that benefit of protecting wildlife or protecting communities. Um, and from that perspective, I just want to say thanks again.